This is Free Speech Radio News for Friday, December 25th. From New York, I'm Dorian Marina. In most places around India, Maoists are an underground hit and run force. But in central India's Bastar forests, they're well entrenched. Join us today for an encore presentation of Maoist India The Search for Economic Justice. In 2009 witnessed a series of attacks by Indian Maoists on state security forces. And now India's central government is hitting back with a counterinsurgency operation known in the media as Operation Green Hunt. The official anti-Maoist campaign includes the deployment of some 75,000 police and paramilitary forces across a swath of territory known as the Red Corridor. Human rights activists fear the operation will largely target the indigenous rural poor who live in mineral-rich areas, and that it could resemble the scorched earth campaign used by the Sri Lankan military to defeat the Tamil Tiger rebels. In 2006, FSRN's Vinod K. Jos traveled to the base areas of the Maoist rebels in central India. Today, we bring you an encore presentation of the documentary, Maoist India, The Search for Economic Justice. With 1.1 billion people, India is the world's second largest populated country. With an 8% economic growth, India is also the world's second fastest growing economy. 900 million people or 80% of India's population live on just $2 a day. Chhattisgarh is located in central India and is one of the worst affected areas. Poverty, starvation deaths and malnutrition are everyday realities. And this region also has a strong base for India's Maoist rebellion. A long call. Thousands assemble for the mass Maoist rallies. Maoists are growing in popularity. They have been effective in organizing the poor peasantry and indigenous people to guerrilla warfare by launching strikes at Indian security force to big mining corporations. <laughs> Hirandul is a very small town, a town known to the outside world for its mining industries. The irony is that India's poorest regions are also the richest in vital natural resources, notably iron, coal and diamonds. These minerals are mostly sent to Europe, US and Japan. The mining industries work non-stop in Kirantu. Inside the forest, clusters of poor villages exist without roads, communication, cables or electricity. Maoist gorillas in uniform govern these villages. Each village falls under an area committee of Communist Party of India Maoists or popularly called Maoists. They have their own judicial system called People's Courts, law enforcing agencies, schools, doctors and a tax collecting department. It is a government that is completely parallel to the government of India. It is also a war zone. The Indian security forces carry out occasional raids and when they fail to find Maoist guerrillas, they carry out violence in the villages. They burn down houses, kill civilians and even rape women. Just an hour before I reached the village Pumpat, the Indian army had carried out an attack. <laughs> Malli's husband, Budru, was killed an hour ago in front of her. She also witnessed her home set on fire. The entire village mourned Budru's death. They covered his body with a red flag, even though he was in the Maoist. The villagers believed he was a martyr, and the red flag is a sign of honoring his martyrdom. Villagers sympathize with Maoists 
and a majority of them are open about it, even when they face violence from occasional army raids. A villager, Uvampaki, Korko, Metki Pospasoyam Toru, Gundaloru, Narge Lotkiyam Toru, why is the army doing this to us? Where was the government all the time when we were starving and dying? Now when the Maoists are helping us to live with some self-respect, the landlords, police and army come heavily on us and kill us in the name of tackling Maoism. Yes, it is true, we support Maoists, we harbor them in our villages. They take up our issues and fight injustice. We consider them better people than the government and they deliver better than the government. The senior Maoist leader in this zone is Ganesh Uike. The Indian government has declared half a million rupees on his head. After walking for 80 miles in the forest, I met Ganesh on the third day. Our fight is to bring justice and to establish a people's democracy. What is democracy when people are not fed, when people are discriminated against? We have political morality on our side, so we are sure we will win the people's war. But we are not bringing people toward us at gunpoint. That is what's being propagated by the government through its corporate media. But ask the villagers. They will tell you how we become popular. Is it by winning hearts or with guns? You are fighting against a nuclear power. How can you win this war militarily? No nuclear state can withstand a genuine people's uprising for change. You don't need to be a Maoist to be optimistic. At least that is what history tells us. Vietnam is such a small country when you compare it to the U.S. But the U.S. finally lost to popular opinion. And the U.S. thought it could tame Iraq in a year's time. It's going to be four years now. The U.S. can't even control Baghdad city. Forget about the rest of the country. Likewise, we believe that since we have popular support, we can bring revolution in India and a Maoist one in that. Ganesh Uike is a postgraduate in chemistry. He joined the Maoist movement 30 years ago. Maoism is also known in India as Naxalism, and Maoists are called Naxalites. Forty years ago, a peasant rebellion started in the eastern Indian state of Bengal in a village called Naxalbari, and the word Naxalite originated from the name of the village. During the Cold War period, the Naxalites witnessed heavy repression due to fears that India would turn red. Vijay Singh is a historian. The party then was um, subjected to terrible uh, repressions and the state machinery was used to assassinate uh, thousands of uh, young youth. Some people say 10,000 people were killed by the state forces. Others say that 20,000 were killed. Some even say 30,000. But mass killings did not ensure elimination of Maoist ideology. It slowly resurrected in different parts of India again, this time with more popular mass organizations and a better equipped military. The realities of poverty, the caste system, feudalism and unemployment provided the right political climate for Maoists to gain people's support. According to last year's government estimates, the People's Gorilla Army consists of over 15,000 trained men and women with another 40,000 strong people's militia. And the Maoists have a presence in 200 of India's 602 districts, a red corridor down a swathe of central India, from the border with Nepal in the Himalayas to the southern state at the Indian Ocean, Karnataka. And this covers close to a third of India's land mass. Hariram is the commander of a local guerrilla squad or LGS, which consists of 100 villages. Militarily, we are growing like never before. Some 20 years ago, we did not have enough locals in the guerrilla squad. Now more and more people say they wanted to join the guerrilla squad. The demand from the youth in the villages is overwhelming. We divert them to mass organization work. Our aim is not to build a strong army alone. Our aim is also to build democratic societies wherever we function. 
You can see how we have done developmental works in the area like mud dams, bridges, and wells. In the summer we suffer from devastating droughts an after effect of your so-called civilized governments not signing the Kyoto Protocol, and so on. Governments don't do anything to tackle the drought. In my area alone, our guerrilla squad made some 40 big wells last year. The percentage of women Maoists have also increased. Well-trained women lead guerrilla attacks against the Indian security forces. Nirmala is one of them. When she was 20 years old, she was drawn towards human rights issues. She was influenced by a medical doctor in her village. The doctor used to talk about revolutionary politics. She supported a friendly organization of Maoists and for 14 years later, she's in the underground squad. Nirmala is adored as a firebrand gorilla and has led squads in a number of military operations. <laughs> Whenever I hold up the gun against the enemy, my dream is social equality, and my sense of justice gives me courage and inspiration. I think it is true with any revolutionary. What is the presence of women in your party? 30% of the guerrilla army are women. When women hold up half the sky, we want to have the same representation in the Maoist party as well. As of now, it is one-third, which is much better than your so-called mainstream politics and parliament, which is only less than 10% women representation. What changes have you made in lives of the women? The forceful marriage was the first issue that we started with. The traditional arranged marriages are against womanhood. Most of the time, women are handed over from one home to another, like objects. It was the Maoist women wing who took up the issue first. We started as a house-to-house -house campaign, and soon it became a movement. Now we don't have any forced marriages in our area. The second issue we took up was violence against women, then equal wages. Women never used to get equal wages as men. Now they get equal wages. Then we concentrated on education, which can provide empowerment. The Israeli army confirmed an operation was underway. India has asked its 12,000 nationals in Lebanon to be ready to move out of the war. The most popular media among the Maoists are radio. None of them miss the bulletins in the local language of All India Radio, the state-owned radio, and the only radio service in India. Each gorilla has one radio set in their knapsack. During my interview with senior leader Ganesh Uke, he quickly realized it was time for the evening news. Majority of the airtime is dominated by Maoists. Today's news was on a gorilla action Maoists carried out 100 miles from here at a security force post and how they took away with them weapons and ammunition. The radio said more than 800 Maoists took part in the operation. The state-owned radio then carried reactions from all mainstream political parties, which consider the Maoists terrorists. Ganesh Uike. The impressions of middle-class people who live in the cities and haven't seen us are influenced by state propaganda like this. They think we're extremists or terrorists. If we were terrorists, do you think hundreds of people would have come with us even in a small operation like raiding a security post? Believe me, thousands are ready to join the guerrillas to do bigger actions than that. Why are people motivated? Because they believe in it. It is a genuine people's uprising. If you want to call it terrorism, you do it, but you are ignoring the issues we raise. One of the issues the Maoists raise in this area is mining. Extraction of natural resources bid enormous revenue for the corporations. But for the local community, they continue to live in poor conditions and are facing different health hazards. This river used to have a name, but the new generation has forgotten the old name. Because in their lifetime, they haven't seen the river in any other color than thick red. And they call it Red River. The waste from the mining areas are dumped in this river, giving it a red color. Now the villagers have to travel miles to get water from wells. Dr. Binayak Sen is with the People's Union of Civil Liberties or PUCL of a nearby town. 
the people of Bastar have not benefited one iota from all the mineral exploitation that has gone on since the last 50 years. But the people have remained, the poverty of the people has remained where it was. So now the people are saying that they uh, want a different uh, exploitation regime in which uh, the genuine interests of the people are uh, kept foremost and uh, they are refused to be exploited in this way anymore. Mining companies are growing big. Television channels declared India was soon going to be a world power. But book winning writers like Arundhati Roy are worried what would happen to the whopping poor. The number of farmer suicides cross about 30,000. And that too, in that number, you know, women are not counted because they are not farmers, because they have no land in their names. And, and of course, this kind of, I mean, these huge numbers of suicide are only the tip of, of the iceberg of, of, of what is a, an agricultural economy that's being garroted. You, you know that there are millions of people living in a rural economy and not a corporate rural economy, a, a community-based, small, broken, subsistence rural economy. You know, these people who want India to be a world power want to eliminate the poor. They would like the suicide rate to increase. So us bleating about it isn't going to help very much, you know. The ruthlessness of that is something we have to face because all of us are always arguing to some, uh, you know, some, some sort of utopian, uh, kind, humanitarian court, but that doesn't exist. There are people who are saying, well, too bad, you know. So what will happen? How, on what basis will we become we, I don't know, I mean, will India become a superpower? How is it going to drag this, this, this mass of poor people along to the global high table? You know, I don't know. Poverty is rampant in this mineral-rich area. This household has not had anything to eat for the entire day. It is already four in the evening. Senior Maoist leader Ganesh Uike is very clear who his enemies are. The government, they're not democratic. They protect people who loot resources and call them businessmen. They bring foreign predatory capital and call it investments. They pass legislation which facilitates the looting and call it reforms. We cannot accept a state which is anti-people. Maoists have a new problem to tackle now. A section of civilians are fielded against them. Villages closer to the landlords and police informers are taken in custody by the security forces, recruited as special police officers or SPOs, and given training to fight the Maoists. Often they fall short of encountering Maoists face to face, but attack the villagers who support the Maoists. They burn down villages and farms to make Maoists unpopular. Civil liberty activists estimates in the first half of this year alone, over 300 villagers are killed by the counter Maoist insurgents called Salva Jutum. Nukubadri's house was burned by Salva Jutum. The Salwa Judum gangs do not come alone. They are accompanied by hundreds of army men. In fact, the Salwa Judum men are fielded as human shields in front of the security forces. They come and destroy everything. Their intention is to terrorize us. They come and kill point blank if they get a hold of us. So when we hear them climbing down the hills, we run away to the deep forest. We stay there until the army and Salwa Judum go back. In frustration of not being able to kill any of us, they burn down our houses and crops. According to a Koya tribal myth, Tuldokri, a god they worship, ran away from Pumpad village because there were plenty of mosquitoes. And there were deadly mosquitoes that took away people's lives. Now these followers are running away in fear of life from Salva Judum and Indian security forces. And when they find their villages is burned down entirely, work begins to build an entirely new village. Cutting trees and building single room sheds, that is home for them. They keep goats, cows and other animals with them. 
Not a very healthy scene. People regularly contract malaria, dengue and TB. Tati Somli is 55 years old and she is from Palmar village. Her daughter was raped and killed two months ago by Salva Judum insurgents. Salwa Judum and security forces raided our village. One day in the dark, all of us ran scared into the forest. My daughter also ran off to escape, but she fell into a ditch and could not escape from there. They raped her and killed her, and they brought her naked body, tying it onto long sticks like a hunted animal, and placed her at our village and then left. They are animals. OMIT is lucky that she did not get killed after being raped. But she says her life was spoiled after the incident. I was working in the field when I got a message that my father was unwell and I had to reach home immediately. I ran to my home, but on the way, special police officers and Salva Judum people saw me running and took me forcefully to the nearest camp of the armed force. The Central Reserve Police Force men tortured me very badly. They wanted information on malice. Then the officers ordered to dump me back at my village. And on the way, these men in uniform raped me at Gangalor village. It was a gang rape, five of them. I was almost dead. Some villagers came and took me to the hospital. I spent many days in the hospital. It rained non-stop for the next two days. The river overflowed and causing floods in some of the villages. People were happy to receive good rain. It was also the beginning of a new agricultural cycle. Bulls blow the land. Wooden blades tied between the shoulders of two bulls are pressed on the soil. And this prepares the land to sow rice. Civil liberties activists think the government is doing something terribly wrong in their attempt to destroy the popularity of Maoists. The violent repression of villages shows how cruel the state can be to their citizens. State violence can only help Maoists gain acceptance among the people. Nandida Haksar is a senior Supreme Court lawyer and civil liberties activist. She thinks the demands of Maoists are democratic and the state should not use violence. Their demands are basically enforcement of minimum wages, statutory minimum wages, and their demands which are really part of uh, a, the Constitution of India. They are, they are not enforceable demands, but they are part of a, what are called the directive principles of state policy. So th I, the question is that why do we need a militant movement to enforce legal rights of people or to enforce citizenship rights of people? So obviously there is something lacking in it, and it is a question of all political democracy. It offers political democracy, not economic democracy. The Maoists continue to be banned under different legislations. Until recently, they were banned under the controversial new terrorism legislation formed after 9-11 called POTA, or Prevention of Terrorism Act. And not just by the Indian government, even the United States is concerned about the growing popularity of the Maoists in the countryside. The U.S. Department of State included the Indian Maoists in the list of banned terrorist organizations. The U.S. Ambassador to India has always been quick in offering the FBI help every time a major Maoist strike is reported. They have also chosen areas near the Maoists for joint military exercises with India. Advocate Nandita Haksa. I would say that it's against international uh, relations or basis of international relations that the U.S. ambassador is interfering in entirely internal affairs of the country. On the other hand, the U.S. has been promoting such economic policies and encouraging WTO to, uh, you know, impose unfair terms of trade, which has led to vast large-scale poverty. So this is the problem, that they do not see the basis of such movements. And they have used the war against terror to actually call any dissent and political movements terrorists in their, their attempt to build up a so-called enemy called the global terrorism. Maoists are best at using folk songs to communicate with the villagers. Even in the age of television and movies, Folk theatre has a convincing presence in rural India. 
Gaddar is a revolutionary ballader. Many call him the most popular cultural activist in rural India. Thousands assemble to watch Gaddar's performance, which is usually done late in the evenings. With candles and torches, poor people walk miles to listen to Gaddar's performance. Gaddar uses an experimental form of theatre with folk songs and dances to communicate his radical ideas. Jin Salute to the martyrs who died fighting for our minimum wages. Salute to the radicals who dreamt of a revolutionary world. The battle is not yet complete. It is left on us to fight for an egalitarian world. The private army of the landlords try to kill Gadda. He still has four bullets stuck inside his spinal cord, which are unable to be removed. He is 65, but still sings and dances in the villages. Like any left organization in the third world, the Indian Maoists have a strong anti-American stance. They identify corporate aggression, WTO policies, World Bank conditions and unemployment to the economic policies promoted by the U.S. administration. Gadda Singh said. Hey friends, see, the Americans are getting angry. Look at the American administration. They are really angry at you. If our government gives subsidies to our farmers, the American government is angry. If we restrict American products in our markets, they get angry again. Where is this America situated? Is it on the other side of the globe? No, it is right there in your homes. It is in the form of toilet soap brands, toothpaste, shaving creams, and now Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Americans get angry if we boycott these products. They will get angry if our unemployed youth protest. America is synonymous with capitalism. This is the thing. Capitalism is the enemy. American administration is the proponent of capitalism. If anyone asks you what is your qualification, you will tell them high school first class, graduation first class, post-graduation first class, PhD first class, and you still can't find a job. Capitalism is the enemy of humanism. We have to defeat it. From the forests and countrysides to university campuses, Maoism is growing in India. Even if we don't see a Maoist takeover in the immediate future, the Indian countrysides are sending a strong message to the world that the people are really unhappy and agitated. For FSRN, from the central and eastern Indian states, this is Vinod Kejus. You've been listening to Free Speech Radio News. You can hear this and other exclusive documentaries by visiting our website, fsrn.org. Join us next week on Monday for our regular newscast. Thanks for listening. In New York, I'm Dorian Marina.